Is that me now? Yes. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Joanne Harris and I'm filling in for Trevor again today. Um, it's wonderful to be back with you on this Monday morning. We've had a few technical issues. You might have seen that right at the beginning. I am sorry. Um, but I'm sure that we will uh, clear those up as we go and we'll have a fab fabulous day. Um, we've had it. We've got a great show today, um, as always. And um, last chance. Look, this is your last chance to get Mother's Day gifts. What have we got? Five days, six days. So um, I'll be sharing some good ideas. Mine pine. Sorry, Joe. I'm back on here, so I'll keep. Sorry, guys, we really are having some technical issues, um, but we're going to get there. We're going to be fine. So um, I'll just start that again. We've got our last chance to get Mother's Day gifts. We've got uh, five or six days left. So I've got some ideas for you, um, as has David Van Berkel from Garden Express. He's going to talk about an ancient significance of a plant called the Willemai Pine. Um, later, I'll share with you the plant of the week. And as always, we'll answer your gardening questions with plenty of prizes to be won. Don't forget to put your state and your city in there. It makes it so much easier for me to direct my answer to you in particular. Uh, we're a big, vast country and it's got lots of different soils and different environments. So we need to know that. Um, and of course, make sure you hit the like button. So let's get started with all the questions because there's quite a few today. And I was really pleased to see that Susan on the north side of Brisbane sent her pictures attached to a question that she'd asked last week and we were unable to answer. So um, Susan has asked, she's planted these trees 11 years ago. They were doing well until a couple of, um, till the last couple of years. And the one on the very left died a year or two ago and they planted a new tree. It's looking very healthy and green, but now the original three trees are looking like they're dying. So she's not sure what to do to help them and can I please help? Well, look, I can actually, um, Susan, now that I've seen the photo, I know exactly what it is. Um, what you have there is what we call conifer canker or um, that's the good one. But right next to it, you can see um, one that has what we call cypress canker or conifer canker. Now this appears when um, your plants get either too wet or too dry, especially in a drought. I suspect that it would be from being too wet perhaps um, in the last little while, especially over the last few months. Um, unfortunately, conifer canker can't be treated. It's a fungal disease that comes between the tree and the bark of the tree. Um, it, it, the tree then becomes, once it's affected by this, um, it becomes very susceptible to other things also. So you can cut out a conifer canker, but it's not going to work, especially not when it's, um, or a cypress canker. The, um, the conifers don't grab, grow back from their old wood. So if you start cutting it out, um, you're going to get a very lopsided tree or a very uneven branch tree, and it's really going to look awful. So once you've got their... Um, there, there used to be a product actually called Fosjet, and you could spray that, you could uh, inject that into the tree, but that's no longer available. So I'm not sure you could perhaps ring an arborist and they may know of something more than I know um, with regard to conifer canker. Um, so really, once the, the your tree has it, and it will spread to others, and I believe it spreads by thrip or by sap sucking in sap sucking insects. Um, so I would suggest that um, you might find, I would actually get rid of the ones that do have any form of it, otherwise it's going to spread to the good ones that you've planted already. Um, not an easy plant to grow in Brisbane uh, because of the susceptibility to this sort of thing. Um, and of course it's very moist uh, where you are. As long as you've got really well-drained soil, you might find that they succeed. So Susan, I hope that's helped you. Um, okay, so we're off to the New South Wales, sorry, yeah, New South Wales South Coast. And Tracy's asked, my frangipani tree has what looks like rust on the leaves. It's well established plant and about seven years old. It's only since we've had so much rain that this has happened. What should I do? 
And Tracy, you're quite right. It is because of the amount of rain that this has happened. Um, and I suspect that I'm going to get a lot of, or Trevor is also going to get a lot of these sort of questions over the next few weeks. We're going to see the repercussions of so much rain and your garden sitting with so much water and not draining quickly enough for the plants. So yeah, if, um, it, you're right, it is a rust. Uh, to treat rust and it is treatable unlike conifer canker it's treatable so you can use a copper oxychloride um, fungicide and that will um, get rid of it for you um, that will certainly help so what you want to do also is you want to make sure that you spray the ground so that you um, the the rust will drop into the ground so you want to spray under the leaves over the leaves and on the ground Make sure that you rake up all the leaves from on the ground because they still will have living spores in them, which will then um, open and go into the tree again. Um, look, whenever you've got something like this also, whenever you've got a problem like a rust or even any pest or disease on your trees and plants, if you can keep them well fed, it's like us. If we're well fed, we get the right sleep, all the rest. The same with trees. If they've got the right environment, the right soils and are well fed for appropriately for them, you'll find they get a lot less um, disease, pests and diseases and you'll be using a lot less um, um, pesticides and, and chemicals that we don't necessarily want to be using in the world today. So, yes, that's what you can do. Um, you'll find that uh, you'll get it more in the warmer months. So look out for it now, get rid of it, and then watch for it coming out of spring because that's when you may get some more rust happening. Um, so what I admitted to say to you, though, is spray it once now, but also spray it again when the tree is bare of leaves, and that will certainly help it. Okay, so um, we're now in Melbourne and Joe has we've got a picture attached or coming up he's got joe has two huge staghorn ferns growing in his fernery and he's noticed this growth on the brick boundary could you could i please tell him if it's a staghorn fern that has sprouted from the spawn the spores um if so i'm keen to transfer some into peat moss tubs and see if i can successfully raise them to mature plants Okay, that is not, unfortunately, that is not the spores that have spawned. That is the, um, it's what we call a mugwort. And there's lots of different types of mugworts. Essentially, it's a weed. So you can get rid of that, and I would. It's, it's one of those weeds that nurserymen call the nurseryman's curse um, because it's constant. It, it can be hard to get out of the soil um, when you see it in a plant. So a good nursery, a good garden centre, just to give you a tip, you won't find these in the, the tops of their plants uh, because they'll send those ones back. Um, in the meantime, what you could do, though, is I notice on the photos that you've sent is there's a couple of pups or one pup on each of them. So you can uh, propagate from pups. You would go in through the shield and cut out the root system of that pup and then uh, plant that into some or put it onto a board straight away or you can do it in soil um, if you're wanting to do it by spores it's much much harder um, well i find it much much harder i find it much easier just using this the the pups however um, what you can do is take off a leaf or part of the shield where you can see the spores put that into a plastic bag um, and or sorry a brown paper bag and let that sit there for quite some time and you'll find that the spores will fall off and into the bag. Then you can put those into some moist peat moss um, and keep it in a fairly um, light area but not too much sunlight. Um, then the, the difficulty with doing um, staghorns from spores is that they can take between uh, any from, from three to six months to actually germinate. Uh, so, you know, try a bit of both maybe, uh, but get rid of, getting rid of um, the mugwort also, or liverwort, sorry, I should call it. Mugwort is actually an artemisia, isn't it? Um, liverwort, um, I use one part vinegar to four parts water. And um, uh, that, you mix it up and then pour it on. 
and the vinegar is what really works with it. The other thing you can do is have a kettle and boil your kettle and pour boiling water onto weeds and that will certainly get rid of them too. Salt's another way. But I find the vinegar in four parts water works really well and it doesn't affect other plants. So uh, Marion is in South Australia and she's having lots of problems with my roses. I'm just learning, but there's obviously something wrong. I was wondering if you could help me, please. Marion, I don't have a photo, so I'm not sure what is actually wrong with your roses. Um, this time of the year, it could well look like you've got a black spot on your leaves. Um, and that is a, um, a fungal issue, especially um, now, where were you from again, Marion? I'm sorry, you're from South Australia. Fortunately, uh, South Australia and West Australia hasn't had as much rain as the part, as the um, East Coast. However, you'll still find with the weather, the way it changes when we get these um, cooler mornings, that um, you will have more, your plants will be more susceptible to something like um, fungal disease, a black spot. So it's very obvious it's a black spot with a, a yellow halo around it on your roses and the leaves will drop. Again, make sure you pick up all those leaves and get rid of them or you will find it will just continue going. Um, then if it's not black spot, it could be a number of things. I know we've got chili thrip here in Perth that we're all treating at the moment. Um, you do get thrips, hopefully not chili thrip, but you do get thrips on, on them also. Aphids is another thing that it attacks roses. Very easy to get rid of them. Uh, use a horticultural oil and um, spray your plant. Again, um, I can't reiterate this enough. If you have a healthy plant, by feeding it well and having it in the right position, you'll find you get lots, uh, a lot less pest and diseases on your plant. So um, perhaps if it was something that I've not hit on today for you, then perhaps what you might like to do is send in a photo by next Wednesday through our Facebook page and we'll be able to, um, uh, to, to direct the answer to you more appropriately. I hope that helps some though. All right, so then we're off to Melbourne again. And Caroline, she bought a dahlia from the Melbourne Garden Show. Should I plant it in the ground or uh, or leave it in the pot? Um, I would probably leave it in the pot till coming out of spring. Uh, you might find that you get a bit of cold weather or, or quite a bit of cold. You may be in part of Melbourne that gets a frost. So I would probably leave that in the pot, Caroline. Um, okay, so we're still in Melbourne. We're staying there and we're talking to Glenn. He has a large front yard and a backyard. For 30 odd years, I've been trying to make look nice, but it seems harder to achieve than my imagination wants me to see. I'm now not working for it after a huge fall, so please advise. Okay, so uh, what can happen to us often, um, Glenn, is that we get to the point in our garden where uh, perhaps if you've been, had a garden for 30 years, you may not want to do all the, the uh, work on it. But I think it's really important. And if you don't want to engage a, a landscaper or a, um, a landscape architect or even uh, just a gardener to help you, um, it's best to know what you're doing. So head down to the garden centre, take some photos of your back and front and maybe take it a little bit of a chunk at a time. So if you're not sure of what you're doing, look at maybe doing the front yard first or the backyard, a section of it. But take some photos down to your garden centre. They'll help you choose some plants that are appropriate for your area um, and ask them all the questions you possibly can. Get as much information as possible. And then even if you do decide um, I don't want to do all the heavy digging or everything about it. I'm going to employ a gardener to do that. If you have all the information, you can direct that gardener to do the right thing by your garden also. And you keep a little bit more control on, on how your budget is spent also, which I think would probably be important at our age. So, Glenn, um, I hope that helps. But, yeah, head down to a I, – I don't know where in Melbourne you are. Otherwise, I might be able to direct you to one of the good garden centres there. But, um, look, I'm sure most garden centres around you will be able to help. Okay. So that's a few of our questions answered. I hope that's helped you a lot too. We're now off to uh, Garden Express, and we're going to have a chat with David Van Berkel. He's got a really interesting uh, plant. Have you ever heard of the wool of my pine? Morning, David. Good morning, Joanne. How are you going? Really well, really well. Wonderful. 
So you have um, this Sorry. amazing, not just um, a, a good value pres uh, thing, but a really interesting plant. Absolutely. It's wonderful. I'm glad you brought one on, on um, camera for us today. They are beautiful, aren't they? Like it's such a fabulous story, the Woolamite pine. You know, discovered in the, in the early 80s, I think it was 1985, they discovered it uh, in the Woolamite State Forest up at the back of Sydney there. And, yes. um, and we got involved really early. So just a chance discovery of a plant that was alive 50, 70 million years ago that the dinosaurs munched on. Like they ate this plant all over what we called Gondwana land, which is New Zealand yes. and the south of Asia when it was all sort of joined together. So, um, so the plant has that history of being in, in many parts of the world. These are the only living specimens found in the entire world. And they found about 100 of them from which we've propagated and, and worked out how to, uh, you know, sustain the life of the Woolamai um, by propagating it and selling it to as many people around the world as possible to conserve yeah. the future. Oh, look, I think it's great. And any, you know, anyone that's a gardener, I know for myself, you can give me a chainsaw or you can give me a really interesting plant. And the interesting plant for Mother's Day I think is fantastic. How do you actually um, post these? Because I know that you're going to you're going to run out, and they're going to go all over Australia, which they can do. So how do you actually post them? Um, it's a really good plant for posting. It just it lasts so long; it requires very little water, especially at this mm. time of year. It kind of goes into a bit of a dormancy through winter, so it needs very little water at all. But we do also have a fabulous presentation shipper, which. Ah. Makes an ideal gift you can see the little dinosaur tree through the hole there uh, and this will post all the way upside down even and it won't damage the tree in the transit process oh that's fantastic packaging at garden express so we've got that one worked out pretty well yeah that looks fantastic and all you need to do when it arrives is put a wonderful bow on it and then you can give it to mum for mother's day all right, Rowan, we should be putting a bow on them for the next week or so. But... <laughs> no, no, no. You post them, we'll do the bow. That's fine. I think the presentation is fantastic from you guys. Yeah, we're um, going to... Rowan and I were just chatting about that, that with Mother's Day coming up but only the only the few days to deliver, there's every chance that you won't be able to get your wool and my there in time. So yeah. we've uploaded a little certificate. When you place your order, you can oh. download and print out the little certificate that says you've bought a wool and my pine and it's on the way. So um, that makes it a, a great present for Mother's Day, even if you haven't got it. As that yet. is so smart. That is just fantastic. I love that idea. Um, look, the wool of mines are easy. People, um, I know people have come into the shop and they've said, oh, but they're hard to grow, aren't they? And they're hard to maintain. They're actually not, are they? They're quite an easy plant to grow. And you can grow them in your garden if you've got a really good space and the right environment, but they grow very well in pots, don't they? Yeah, they're ideal for pots. They just, they've got a really fibrous uh, root system and they restrict their growth size to the volume of space that that root ball can grow in. So if you put it in, for example, a, a wine barrel, you'll get a plant that grows up to maybe about 12, 15 feet tall, but it won't get as big as it can do in a wild environment, so to speak. The other aspect of the Woolamai is the reason it survived is even when, if one falls over, it will coppice and grow new new shoots from the yeah. trunk that it lays down on the ground, whereas a gum tree or something will just start to rot. A woolamai will find ways to keep growing. So uh, the main key is don't overwater your woolamai. Yeah, that is that is the main key about it. Um, test when you, you've watered and don't water if it needs watering, uh, if it's um, still moist. Look, I think it's great. And I think the other thing um, that uh, people need to know too is that a slow-release fertiliser is good for it. One with a low phosphorus um, yes. component so is the best. It must, yeah. it must be a native fertiliser because that's the, the only other thing that will uh, will have a negative impact on your on your woolamai is that phosphorus in fertiliser. So giving it yeah. a, you know, just whatever you've got does not work in this circumstance. So a native yeah. fertiliser and not overwatering. And probably the other biggest thing that we've learned that, that people sometimes make the mistake is when you transplant it into new soil and you water it, the water can run to the new soil but not the centre of the root ball because it is such a fibrous root ball. So slowly dribbling that water on to make sure 
that the small amount you do give it goes to where it's needed and then it will grow into the new soil when it's ready. That's really smart advice. Um, I often say to people too that if they if they can't do the slow dribble or if it isn't working, pop your pot inside another vessel and let it um, absorb the water up through that way until you see no more bubbles. So yeah, it's the same course. thing. And, and the yeah. wool and mire, as I said with that dormant thing, transplanting a wool and mire between now and, say, uh, the middle of August is probably of no value because the roots aren't growing. So leave yeah. it in the pot that it comes in, enjoy it for the six months, and then an early spring pot up is, is the best time for wool and mire because the roots will want to develop uh, and then the new fronds will come out to be beautiful. Yeah. And you don't want to put it in too big a pot from what it is. What size pot is it in now? Is it a 150 mil pot or yes, a it's bigger? a 150 mil pot and you probably go yeah. to something like a 300 or even a 400 okay. mil. And if you want oh. something like a patio, 400 mil pot is superb for the patio Perfect. height, for the size of the tree that you're going to get. Restricting it to a 400 would be perfect. That's fantastic. So I think, you know, they're easy to look after. They, The only thing that um, I know that they do get over here in Perth is sometimes some red spider mite and some aphids. We're all used to that on our plants anyway. So, And the, the, the way to deal with it is the same as any other plant. So although it's this really special, unusual plant, it doesn't take a lot of looking after and it's easy. And the other thing that you're um, sending with it is a book. Is that correct? Have I... Yes, you is. So is it the history of the Woolamine pine as well as how to look after it or just the history? The, the, the tree itself comes with a 16-page a growing guide, which is all of our wow. advice on how to pot up the plant, how to grow the plant, the things to look for. Uh, and, and I hadn't heard of the aphids and the red spider mite. We haven't had that over here, um, but that's okay. an interesting one that we'll, we'll keep an eye on. But the book is the story of the pine's discovery. <laughs> it is in the back. Um, the the Woolamite Pines discovery, the three guys who trekked out to, uh, to accidentally find it, and the whole story of how it, it came to be identified because thousands of people could walk past this and never have discovered what it truly yeah. is. So, um, so, yeah, it's a wonderful book by James Woodford uh, talking all about how the Woolamite was discovered, and uh, it comes free with the purchase of the Woolamite uh, this week, Rowan, for $99. Wow, that's um, that's a good price because they're normally one hundred and thirty. Would that be right about that? Yeah, they they vary out there in the marketplace from from one hundred and ten to one hundred and thirty dollars for sure. Okay, uh, I All think right. our regular price is just the ninety nine. We keep it pretty good at Garden Express as as we are the growers of it, uh, and throw yeah. the book it's just some excellent value and a really interesting read as well. Oh, absolutely! Happy Mother's Day to everyone, and the certificate. If you don't get it on time for your mum, you've got the certificate to give them and she's got an extended Mother's Day. Exactly. I a few love days it. extra and, uh, and there's the present in the mail. So excited. I love it. Yeah. Well done. Thanks for your time today, David. Really appreciate um, you coming Thank on the show. You. Enjoy your day. Thank you. And you too. Thanks yes. very much. All right. Well, that's fantastic. Seriously, guys, get on to it. Um, it's well worth it. Um, so now we're heading off to Belgrave um, and it's Margaret and she said packaging from Garden Express is excellent, the best packaging. And it is. She, she's quite right. Um, okay. So we're back to some Q&As now, some questions. Ah, hello, Tyson. You're back on again. And Tyson, of course, we all know is from Baronia, Victoria. And he wants to know, can he plant cabbage seeds in my garden bed? And can you please give me some tips and advice? Thank you, Joanne. Well, yes, you can plant your seeds in a um, in your garden bed. As I said last week, um, Tyson, I tend to put mine into a seed raising mix first and do it that way. I find that just much easier than putting them straight into the soil. But you may have much better soil than I've got, um, in which case, yes, you can put them straight in. And Tyson, did you have a look at that list on Eden Seeds? It's um, it's a great list. I hope you did. It's um, excuse me, it's a good resource and worth you looking at. So now we're down to Kylie. We don't know where Kylie's from, but she's got a picture attached, and um, she has an old tree stump in the garden, and we have mushrooms coming up. But tonight we notice they glow in the dark. Our neighbours and ourselves have never seen anything like it. 
Um, Kylie, I've not seen them either, but I have heard about them. Aren't they amazing? So what you're seeing, the first photo that you saw there is just during the day, I imagine, or early evening. And then the next um, picture, that's when they're actually um, glowing. Now, I believe that a mushroom um, of, uh, like that are called bioluminescence or luminescent mushrooms. Um, I'm not sure whether they're edible or not. I think that was um, one of your other questions. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. And I would never want to say to you, yes, go ahead and eat them. Apparently, from what I've read about them, uh, most are edible. But who knows with them? And But most of them, there's 148,000 odd um, varieties of mushrooms. Of, of that, only 70 are bioluminescent. Uh, so you want to, and, and you probably therefore could go to a mushroom expert. You've probably, whereabouts are you from again? We don't know. But we, you, you probably find there's a mushroom society or association that you could get that information from. Um, personally, I don't eat any mushrooms unless I know exactly what they are. Um, but that's really exciting. And it's exciting because most of the bioluminescent mushrooms are found in caves and really dark areas, whereas yours is just outside around a tree, breaking the tree down nicely and um, giving a great show. So thanks for that question. That was really interesting. Um, okay. So now we're in Victoria, and I'm probably going to pronounce this correctly, Acidon. Um, and I'm not even sure where Acidon is, uh, but Linda from Acidon has a viburnum plant suffering from leaf fungus. I've been spraying with neem oil. The branches are green, then are green when thumbed. Um, it is worth removing. Is it worth removing all the leaves, or should I take the plant out altogether? No, I would um, have a look at, oh, it's Macedon. I'm sorry, Linda, we had the wrong spelling up there. That wasn't me. <laughs> anyway, um, your viburnum plant suffering from leaf fungus. Um, no, I wouldn't. I would spray it with a copper oxychloride or perhaps a mango zeb if you've got mango zeb in your cupboard, um, and I would take it from there. Neem oil is a fabulous product but may not hit this particular issue well enough for you. Um, is it worth removing the leaves? No, don't do that. If the leaves um, are damaged enough that the, the plant or the shrub no longer requires them, uh, it will drop those leaves. Um, make sure that you, again, make sure that you rake them all up because it is a fungal issue. And I would spray not just the plant, but I would spray around the bottom. Um, viburnums are an easy access plant. You can get those in any garden center that you go to. Um, so if you found or if you thought that your plant was um, was really damaged by it and wasn't going to survive, then yes, just take it out and go and get another one. Okay, so now we're on to Alan. Alan, excited and visited the Guildford Garden Centre. What an awesome staff, so happy to help. They look like an awesome team. The huge selection of plants from herbs to trees, plus our, plus our bush tucker variety were awesome. I'm involved with setting up a community garden in Padbury, so I was making a huge shopping lift list. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, Guildford Garden Centre is run by myself and my two daughters, um, and it's out in the foothills of, um, of uh, Perth. And yeah, we, we pride ourselves on being a really good garden centre. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, and hopefully I can help here on Garden Gurus with everyone else too. Okay, so we are, it's Mother's Day. And as I've um, alluded to earlier, um, Mother's Day is fine by me if my kids want to buy me a chainsaw or a blower or Anything else along those lines, I love it. I hope they're watching this morning. It might give them some ideas. Um, however, Trevor went along and visited one of the still shops and um, has some really good ideas for mum. So let's have a look at that now. Daniel, great to see you, mate. G'day, how are you? Good. Now, listen, I've got a problem and I need some help. Mother's Day, she's around the corner. My mum, she's getting on. 
loves to get out and keep the paths clean, but getting out with a broom all the time is hard work. Now, I want to get her a blower, but she doesn't like the petrol power blowers. They're too heavy and there's too much mucking around with fuel. So, what's the next option? Okay. We have a couple of range in our battery blowers. Yeah. We have the latest and greatest is the um, integrated battery. Right. At very lightweight, only 2.2 kilo. 2.2 kilo. 2.2 kilo. You can feel that. That's really well balanced. And it is. Look at that. Yeah. So light. Yeah, they are. They're very yeah. light. Only it's incredible. Nice and easy to operate. We've got a, a um, throttle lock and a safety switch. Just engage that and away wow. we go. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. And very it's powerful too. Very powerful, yep. Okay, and that is so light, so that is definitely a that solution. That is the lightest that we can get yep. for somebody that's got a small courtyard. We've got an approximate run time of about 25 minutes. 25 minutes is all anybody's going to need normally in a, in a garden, a small garden. Correct. What if it's a little bit bigger? So a little bit bigger, we can step up to the next system, which has a battery that is detachable that will fit into a, a number of other tools. All right, so you've got a whole range of tools that sit in this collection Correct. too. Correct, so range from the blowers to the chainsaws, mowers, line trimmers and a few more. So as long as you've got the batteries, you can run a multiple tools. Correct. Okay, now what about battery. weight? This is a bit heavier, isn't so they're it? A little bit heavier, roughly about 4.5 kilos when we attach the battery. It's still not that heavy yep. and really powerful. Yeah, a lot more powerful. Oh, I don't know, mate. I think... I think I might get this one for my wife because she's pretty muscly. Okay. And this, this one, one for mum. For mum. Okay, beautiful. What a way to go. Thanks very much. Thank you. Daniel, great to see you, mate. G'day, how are you? Good. Now, listen, I've got a problem and I need some help. Mother's Day, she's around the corner. My mum, she's getting on. Loves to get out and keep the paths clean, but getting out with a broom all the time is hard work. Now, I want to get her a blower, but she doesn't like the petrol power blowers. They're too heavy and there's too much mucking around with fuel. So, what's the next option? Okay. We have a couple of range in our battery blowers. Yeah. We have the latest and greatest is the um, integrated battery. Right. At very lightweight, only 2.2 kilo. 2.2 kilo? 2.2 kilo. You can feel that. That's really well balanced. And it is. Look at that. Okay, we're on. Hi, well, as I said before, I'm hoping that uh, my children are watching that. Um, they look fantastic. I like the fact I have a stool blower, uh, but it's quite heavy, um, and I, we use them at the garden centre. Um, however, um, those look fantastic. So um, I hope one of the kids is watching this. If not, I'll have to throw a, uh, a bit of a... a uh, a bit of a, a, a line out there to them. All right, so let's get on with this. It is now plant of the week. And I was so disappointed last week that we didn't get to talk about fuchsias because Garden Express had sold out. Um, it's a plant that I find really intriguing. And there's a new one that's come in. Um, it's not actually a new plant, although I think this is a, a new hybrid of it. Um, and it's called fuchsia. I'll bring it over. It's called fuchsia... Lutini. All right. So this is one of um, the more hardier fuchsias that can be growing in um, in the garden bed. You don't have to necessarily, if you've got the right spot and you haven't got a lot of frost, or like us here in West Australia, you wouldn't certainly wouldn't want to put it into full sun. Although the label says full sun to part shade. Don't forget to always ask your garden centre operator or the the girls at the garden centre. Um, where a plant should really be put because these labels are made for uh, for one area they're not made for the whole of Australia so if you read on it uh, full sun don't necessarily especially if you're in West Australia don't put this into full sun it would take a very small amount of morning sun and it'd be fantastic on a patio okay so fuchsias I don't know if you people know but fuchsias are in fact edible the flower is edible, the leaf is even edible, but the berry um, that comes after the, the flower is edible. Now, some of them are more tart than others. And um, the easy way to recognize which ones you would want to eat and not eat is the fluffier, the fuller, um, the more um, petals on it, the less it's going to taste well. So the more simple ones that have tubular flowers, like, the, like this one, um, will have um, a beautiful blue berry afterwards that's full of antioxidants and vitamin C. Um, I don't know if you can see that. I should have taken the, the thing off. Can we see? Yep, look at that. No, it's just 
not going to work. I've now gone and moved the camera. There we go. Come back to me. Okay. So, uh, but it's these beautiful pink flowers that come in spring right through to summer. With a fuchsia, um, they like to be tip pruned. So um, what I tend to do is, especially through autumn, I'll tip prune them, just nip the top out of them like that, and then you'll find that they end up getting nice and bushy. Um, they don't like to be wet, so don't make sure that you don't um, put them put too much water in them. They certainly don't like it. They're great for bees and butterflies, so they're a good pollinator. They're not good for um, for birds because the flower hangs down too low, so the bird can't get it. But they're really great for bees and butterflies, which of course we want to make sure get some pollination. Imagine some honey made from fuchsia flowers. I wonder what that would taste like. Um, so this is one of the hardier varieties, and you know that because it's got a woody stem, okay, whereas most of the other ones that you find, you find them in hanging baskets, and they're often this beautiful weeping plant. That They're, they're the most popular ones that you see around. Um, but I think you'll find these ones um, you'll see in the garden centres more and more at the moment. Um, feed, for fertiliser for them, you want a balanced fertiliser 20-20-20, so you want a really good balanced fertiliser. Um, otherwise, they're very actually very easy to grow, um, much easier than what often people think. So that is the beautiful fuchsia blue, uh, blue teeny. Um, get down to your garden centre and see if you can't find that one. All right. So plant of the week. And I was very good. I reduced it to one plant this week, not um, multiple as I usually do. So let's have a look. Um, so... Uh, one of the things I didn't talk about with the, the blue teeny is the sort of soil you want. And um, it just likes um, a good premium potting mix. Um, so, But it's, it's really good when you can find potting mixes for specific things. And today I wanted to talk about um, succulent potting mix, um, succulent and cacti. Now, succulents and cacti like a very sandy, well-drained soil. And if you put them into a good premium potting mix, it's just going to have the wrong fertiliser to start with. And also it's, it's going to hold too much water at the roots and you will get root rot. So Scott's um, Osmocote uh, Cacti and Succulent Potting Mix has been developed. It is a premium potting mix. It has those lovely red ticks on it to, to prove to you that it's an Australian um, premium potting mix. But it's been developed with a really well draining mix that has the ideal aeration. Um, now that'll meet the specific physical and um, nutritional needs of cacti and succulent and that's always really important to do. Um, it, it includes the Scots Osmocote so that gives you a feed for at least six months Perhaps if you've done the potting early summer and you live in a hot area like Perth, like north of Sydney, you might find it doesn't give you quite six months. It might only give you the five months. So keep that in mind. But I love the whole package that Scots have developed. They've got the pour and feed cacti and succulent fertilizer too. And it's just what it says, pour and feed. So there's no mixing. There's no fast. It's a really easy one to deal with. Um, so it and it's formulated with the low nitrogen and high potassium which is what they need um, which is why you want to put it into a good succulent potting mix also then you know you've got the right um, the right environment and the right formula um, and the succulents will just keep thriving for weeks on that I tend to always follow my fertilizer up and I like um, a liquid fertilizer especially something like for cacti but I follow it up with the slow released or sorry it's not slow release it's a controlled release fertilizer and it's exactly the same it's it's low nitrogen increased potassium excuse me i'm going to cough i'm so sorry um it's great for the steady growth of your cacti and succulents it's a really smart way to to fertilize and one application is going to continue on for six months again i tend to kind of overcompensate a little bit after the hot months and instead of waiting six months, I usually give it another little feed at five months. But then through the, the, the autumn and the spring, you can uh, rely on the six months completely. Um, Scott's Osmocote uh, Controlled Release Fertiliser, 
their um, potting mix and the cacti um, and succulent pour and feed. You get that with your cacti. It's a great thing for mum. Get down and get yourself a cacti for her, a pot. You could pot it up or buy her that package and show her how easy it is to look after her um, succulents. Again, put a bow on it and it'll look fantastic. Okay, so let's get back to the uh, questions and answers now. And don't forget to hit that like button, please. So Steve, Steve, we don't know where you're from, but my apple tree is blossoming already. Has it dropped its and hasn't dropped its leaves? Should I remove, remove the blossom? Look, um, I've been contemplating that. I've got a um, plum tree that's doing a similar thing. And to be honest, I'm not too sure whether you should or not. I think you'll find that those will just drop themselves. And I think it's the really weird weather that we've been having recently that's, um, that's caused it. Steve, um, you're from central Victoria. So uh, what I would like to do is um, get an answer for you. Um, and I, as I said, um, my plum tree is doing it and I wanted to have a good look at, not just give you a, an answer of leave it, but uh, perhaps something better. So I'll come back. If you want to tune in next week, Steve, I'll make sure that I've got an answer for you for that also. Okay, so Rena, um, she has magnolias that look, these look rage nodule, raised nodules and I opened one up and there were red seeds in it. Can these seeds be planted to grow uh, magnolias? Yes, you can. Uh, you can um, plant um, a magnolia from seed. I would imagine that you would have to, I've not done it. Um, I'm not a grower. Um, however, um, I think you'll find that you would need to scarify it or at least soak it on some cotton wool for quite some time because I have a feeling it's got a fairly hard surface. So that's what you would need to do with it. Um, if you can hear that noise, we've got a, a street cleaner out the front. So I hope it's not uh, too noisy for you. We'll um, get someone to move them along. Um, Okay, so uh, try having a look at um, uh, putting it on some, some cotton wool with some, some uh, water. Keep the cotton wool moist and that should germinate and you could go from there. Slow going, most of these um, are done by tissue culture or by cuttings and that might be a lot easier than just the seed. But it's interesting to try, isn't it? I, um, I like trying those sort of things. Okay, Jill, we don't know where Jill's from. How do I keep cats out of the gardens? Oh, they're your neighbor's cats too. Two things, go and see your neighbor and ask them to keep them inside at nighttime um, and you'll probably get thrown out because they'll be cat lovers. The other thing you can do is maybe plant some, some um, things like, ah, oh, what is it called? Uh, catnip, cat mint and dog bane. Uh, Dogbane is the one that I used. However, my uh, dog that I've had up until very recently loved it and she used to roll her head in it and loved it completely. So it didn't work for her at all. But my previous dog, Molly, she hated it and she would actually walk around the area. And I think that's, that's the thing. You've got to work out what your cat um, likes or what the cats next door like and dislike and if they're going into areas of your garden you might need to place these appropriately around otherwise there's not a lot you can do about keeping cats out I have seen um, and I'm not sure how this works but when I worked I lived in a neighborhood with lots of gorgeous old Italian people living in there too um, I'd often see a bottle half bottle of water on the front lawn and I wondered if that was to keep the cats and dogs away. Might need to Google that and see what, what um, they say. But otherwise, maybe invite your um, neighbour over for a cup of tea or coffee or a glass of wine. Show them your gorgeous garden and um, just start talking to them maybe. All right, so I hope that works for you because there's nothing worse than um, finding what cats do in gardens. Um, Evelyn, now I'm not even going to try and try and say this one. Kuna, Kunal Pine, Kunal Pine, South Australia. Someone can correct me. I'm sure I've got that wrong. But Ev we're going to um, help Evelyn with hi all. I'm having major issues on my plants. It started in my veggie garden, now progressing to my orchids. I have had aphids and control them, but these are very very small white bugs the size of needle tips. 
I've tried heaps of sprays but with no help. I wonder if it's, um, it'd be great if you could send a photo in of those because then we'll know exactly what they are. But I do wonder if maybe thrips are normally black, but I'm wondering if there may be a thrip or it's certainly a microscopic sort of insect. Um, and it would be interesting to see what they are to know how to deal with them. If it's thrips, you could always get something like EcoFend or Success um, to be able to spray on them. Um, and something like Success might, it's a systemic and it may in fact affect whatever the bug is and get rid of them. Um, but if you can send us, I know that you said that they're microscopic, but if you can see them, you may be able to photograph it for us. And that certainly would help and we can give you a, um, a better answer to that. All right, so, gee, there's lots of questions here, guys. Uh, Michelle from Adelaide, her lemonade tree uh, fruited out of season over summer, but the lemons were dry. Should I pick them off? Yep, I would. Take them off um, because, as you say, uh, you want the tree to put the energy into the, not into the fruit, but into the tree. In fact, it's going to go dormant rather soon. Uh, once the cold weather uh, hits along and you're in Adelaide, I imagine it's similar to Perth that you're getting cool mornings and um, and warmer days. So the ground is still nice and warm, so you'll get some root growth. Um, I would be uh, giving you uh, fertilize your citrus with a good citrus fertilizer and take all those fruit off and let the, the tree really establish well again over winter and, and start again. Uh, lemonade trees are fabulous. Um, so I hope you get a really good crop of them next year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so Jenny's in WA, Bougainvilliers. She's in Albany and she hasn't had any luck growing Bougainvilliers, just wonder, wondering about fertilizer to use. Well, you know, um, they don't actually need a lot of fertilizer. Um, Jenny, the, and, and I'm wondering also, you're in Albany where you can get very cold winds and it can be much colder than here in Perth. So um, it could well be that um, you're, you need to tuck your bougainvillea into a really sheltered position, preferably a north-facing position so that you get a lot of warm sun on that. Um, and uh, try and keep it a sheltered position away from the cold wind. As far as fertilizer goes, um, I use um, two different fertilizers that I like on my general gardening needs. And um, one is GrowSafe, the Sabrina Hahn GrowSafe, and the other one is EcoVital. Both have fantastic microbial um, activity in them and minerals. So you're feeding the soil as much as you're feeding the plant. And I think that's a really important um, aspect of, of fertilizers. Um, so yeah, I, I would say, have a look at where you've got it planted. And um, if need be, once it goes dormant in winter, you could move it if need be. Cut it back and then move it. Okay, so Andrea we, is unknown also. Um, please put your, uh, your address, not your address, sorry, but your suburb and your state, and it just helps me so much more. Anyway, Andrea, we'll try and fill this in for you. I repotted my rose into specialist rose potting mix. I measured the, the soil pH, but it says 4.5. I read, I read diluted vinegar poured around the um, the roots <clears throat> will raise the, pH, raise the pH. Is this correct, please? You know, I don't know. I've never used vinegar in that manner. I've only ever used it to kill weeds and um, things like that. So I'm not sure. I would be more inclined to give it a dose of sea salt and then also look at um, the fertilizer, maybe something like Eto Vital that will certainly help with the, the soil too. Um, 4.5 is, um, is fairly acid. Uh, but a rose, it, it should take it okay, um, especially if you put some good fertilizer into there. And, and the sea soil will help with the soil and change the change it a little bit too. All right, so we're now off to New South Wales in the New South Wales south coast. And Maureen has said, hi, when can I trim my hebe? Um, thank you. Uh, it's finishing flowering. That's when you when you do it. It's like most plants. So if you 
tip prune it now I would um I wouldn't prune it really hard but I would certainly take all the flower heads off and maybe take down to 30 percent only of that plant and that should be sufficient it's going to go a little bit dormant over um over winter time you'll get lots of root growth happening if you've got it in good soil and feed it well now um, and then if you need to prune it again if you find that it's a little bit leggy when it starts growing again again just take another 30 percent off um, once it's grown um, somewhat in spring um, okay so upway glenn is from upway and how far can i cut a nectarine tree because my tree has grown way too big once again, at this time of the year, I would only be cutting it back um, minimal, 30% uh, at the most, probably even 10%, I think, perhaps at this time of the year. I'm not sure where Upway is, sorry. So I'm not sure if you've already got frosty mornings or whether it's cooler than what we are here. If the tree has started to go into dormancy, um, I would probably consider waiting until springtime and then I would, um, I would uh, prune your tree from then. Um, make sure too, one of the things that I was taught um, well after I did my horticultural degree and I, I did a, a pruning course um, with a guy called Craig from Allenby Tree Farm and one of the things that Craig really, um, really uh, pounded into us was that if you were to hover above your fruit tree, you want to look at it as if it's like a donut. So you want to be able to prune the middle part out so that the, the sun can get into all areas of that inside part of the tree too. So sometimes we think we need to prune our tree and in fact we can tip prune the tree, but we do need to clean up the middle part and any dead uh, wood. That's really important. Okay, so we're going off to Belgrave and Margaret says, I just love selvias. Me too, Margaret, you're my type of person. Um, what is the best way to propagate salvias, please? There's a couple of easy ways. Look, um, take softwood, well, they're not, um, take the soft tips and you can propagate those into a seed raising mix very easily. Um, I've got a couple that um, are spreading um, salvias and I tend to layer those. So I'll push a, a branch down into the soil and hold it down with a, um, a clip of some sort. Um, and that'll then take root. So then cut that part off the main uh, plant and then plant where I want to um, extend the salvias out. They're very easy to grow and they're such a fabulous plant. Um, I was really sorry in Perth. I'm hoping that everywhere else in Australia have a lot more salvias than we can get our hands on to. Um, shout out to all the growers here. We need more salvias um, to be able to sell because they are a fabulous plant to have. Um, okay, so we're going up to the north side of Brisbane, and this is from the first question. Okay, sorry, just follow up my question regarding the conifers that are dying. We need the tr we need to tree the soil once it has been removed. Will conifer canker affect other plant types? No, it won't, Susan. It won't affect other um, plant types, but it certainly will um, affect the other conifers and that's what I'm concerned about. The fact that you've put in a nice new one and it's looking really good, you might find if you don't remove the one next to it that's got conifer canker, you certainly will get it. And the other ones, the older, the two other older trees, I suspect that you'll get conifer canker in those also. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a hard one, but you might have to remove them all and start again. Now, um, will we need to treat the soil once they are removed? No, you shouldn't have to, but I would make sure that your soil is well drained um, and that you've got good organic matter in it once you decide what else you're going to plant into it. Thanks for the follow-up, Susan. Um, Kalgoorlie, okay, so we're going out to Kalgoorlie and Ilana. Um, she's looking at transplanting an established frangi frangipani tree in the coming weeks. Can you please give me some advice on the best way to go about this? I'm wondering if we need to let it dry out or if it can go straight into the ground. Also, should be trim back the foliage beforehand. Okay, so Alana, like most trees that you're going to transplant, um, it's a really good idea. I think, firstly, you're looking at a frangipani tree. I would tend to try and do that sooner than later. Um, I know that in Kalgoorlie, you can get some pretty cold nights out there. So um, I would be inclined to go out 
and I would dig a trench right around at the, the drip line and the drip line is the outermost edges of the leaves. So dig a trench, uh, maybe 15 centimetres deep only. It doesn't have to be very deep. You can go down a bit deeper to 20 if you want to. And I would then water that and put a half, um, half strength solution of sea salt in that or half strength solution of eco vital if you've got that um, into that trench and let it go down into the root system leave it for a couple of days maybe water it if you haven't had if you're not getting rain out there give it another water around that trench then you want to dig it out with as much root system as possible um, so dig around from that down you will take off some there will be some feeder roots that maybe have gone a little bit further than the drip line don't worry about that just give them a good clean cut uh, with a nice sharp spade um, and then um, I would be putting that into the new position with some good organic matter if you find that the root system is small or smaller than especially smaller than where the drip line is yes cut those back so come back into whatever the root system is and then go from there and I think your other question was do you need to dry it out if you were to take cuttings off this tree and do it by um, do it by cuttings and by branches yes you would but when you've got the root system no you don't want that to dry out you want to put that straight in so I hope that helps I bet frangipanis grow really well out in uh, Kalgoorlie uh, Melbourne, Victoria. We're off to speak to John in Melbourne, Victoria. And May is that his azaleas, my azaleas are dying. What should I do? I have been spraying and also watering every second day. Well, it's kind of hard to know, John, what's wrong with your azaleas. Um, is it azalea petal blight? Is it red spider mite? Is it that it's not in the right area? So I'm going to give you a little bit of um, information and perhaps, John, if you tune in next week and you want to give me a little bit more information, then we can help you a bit more than that. Azaleas are a, um, a shallow rooted plant. So you always want to have a good mulch on, those, uh, on the soil for azaleas because they can get too hot by the, the sun, they can heat or they can also get too cold in the winter time, the root system, and it just slows them down and it, it means that the plant is as, isn't as healthy as what it could be. So uh, keep that in mind. And then the other thing is um, Google um, uh, azalea petal blight and you'll see it. The petals of the flower will actually go, they look like they've got like a rot. Um, so have a look at that. If you've got something and you will also see a bronzing on the top of the leaf, um, then red spider mite is something that it's often in an azalea. Um, so what I would uh, tend to do is look for little webbing. If you can find some really fine webbing on, on the underneath and on the apex of the leaf and the branches, um, that's when you know you've got red spider mite and you really need to... Um, to spray for that because they will go downhill very fast. Um, the other thing I guess with azaleas is that they are gross feeders. So it's the gardenias, azaleas, camellias, hydrangeas, uh, rhododendrons, all of those sort of plants are gross feeders. And if you feed, especially gardenias and azaleas, if you feed them every time you feed your roses, or if you don't have roses, that would be every four to six weeks, um, you will find that if you gross feed them, they will be a lot healthier and you'll have a lot healthier and you'll get less pest and diseases. Um, so I hope within that there was something within that that can tell you, um, uh, you know, what, what's happening with yours. If not, I mean, it could also be the position. There's a whole bunch of things it could be. So come back to it. Come back to us if I haven't hit on something that makes sense to you. All right. So we're off to... Wagga. I'm not going to get that wrong this week. I think a couple of weeks ago I called it Wagga Wagga and it's it's Wagga, right? I've got it right. So Ben from Wagga. Um, Hi, Joe. My camellia leaves are starting to turn brown. However, the camellia next to it is fine. So I don't think it's burning. Would, what would you suggest I do? Um, good question, Ben. Um, so what you need to check is are those leaves going brown at the tips and are they soft? 
or are they brown at the tips and, and, and around the margins? Are they crisp? So if they're brown and soft, we're overwatering. If they're brown and crisp, you're underwatering. Or should I say, overwatering your your soil is holding the moisture too much, or it, the pot is not well enough drained. Um, it could be that your practice is that you're watering that one too much, but I would suggest given that you've got them close together, it's more likely to be that the soil is holding the moisture. If you're underwatering or if there is um, wind, I don't imagine it's wind because, again, you said that um, your other one was um, okay and it was quite close. So I would suggest that if you're hand-watering, you may be underwatering or overwatering. That's most likely what it is. So watch your watering practices. It's a really important one actually for all plants to know. And we certainly don't want to waste the water resources that we have. We've got little of it enough as it is. So let's get that right with all plants. So we're back in Perth and we're down in Thornley and Anna wants to know, where can I buy two dwarf crab apples called Cinderella? Right, well, just for a little bit of self-promotion. <laughs> uh, look, uh, not all garden centres do sell um, the, the crab apples. Um, I'm not sure that we have Cinderella coming this year, but every winter you'll find that there's a lot of garden centres or a number of garden centres, not a lot actually, but a number of garden centres will get in what we call bare root trees. And I'm certainly getting those in the second week of June and the, the middle of July. What I would suggest you do is that you contact the garden centre or your garden centre and ask them if they are going to be having the Cinderella come in at wintertime. If not, then I'm quite happy to self-promote and send you off to Guildford Town Garden Centre. Um, send us an email or have a look on our website and you'll see the varieties. They'll all say, or most of them will say, out of stock at this time of the year because most of us at the garden centres won't have them still in stock. Um, but if it says out of stock, be aware that they're coming in in winter time. So, yeah, give, give your garden centre a ring and see if they can help you. If not, give the Guildford Garden Centre a call. All right. So there was a lot of questions today. Thank you very much for all of them. I really appreciate that you're, um, you're still on there watching us. Um, have you been enjoying um, the 20th anniversary of the Garden Guru show? I know I certainly have been. Before we wrap up, here's a sneak peek of what's to come for episode 11. If you're one of those people that love indoor plants, then this is the perfect environment to get them growing. You see, they love this sort of atmosphere and you'll end up with the most lush, beautiful plants. One of the essential tools if you've got a larger block, lots of trees, or you're an industry professional, is a chainsaw. And they are quite intimidating tools for the first time user, but this is where industry leading battery operating saws are the way to go. There's so much to love about Collector's Plant Fair. It's Disneyland for gardeners. 80 specialist growers from right across the nation have unloaded the biggest range of plants in Australia. It's held at the Hawkesbury Race Club. It's the plant fair that stops the nation. Thanks. Okay, guys, that was, that was interesting. I can't wait for episode 11. So hit the like button for me, will you? Uh, we're very sorry if we didn't get to your question today. Honestly, we had so many flying through. Um, we really appreciate all the engagement and I hope that we're giving you back what you actually need too. Obviously, we are because it just keeps happening. Uh, Robin, our fantastic producer, will be sending out messages to all our seed winners after today's show. Um, the wonderful Trevor will be back next Monday with another session of Garden Gurus Live at 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Time and for those WA viewers, 10 a.m. Uh, don't forget to get your photo submissions in by um, via Facebook via, um, by Wednesday. Um, remember to state your name, state and suburb um, and, of course, the question. Uh, remember, you can always jump onto the website and catch up with previous um, stories from the Garden Gurus at thegardengurus.tv um, or on our YouTube channel also at thegardengurus.tv. You can listen back to today's live stream and catch up on previous episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcast and Audible. And don't forget to tune into Channel 9 this Saturday at 4.30pm 
local time to catch episode 11 of the Garden Gurus Autumn 2022. Happy gardening, everyone. Until next time, have a great time. Thanks.